Welcome to Islington Mill and the monthly podcast series about one of the UK's most beloved artist-led cultural creative central hubs, Salford's Islington Mill. I am your host, The Nihilist, and for this month's edition of Islington Mill and it is part three of our irregular series, Upwording. Having dipped our toes a couple of times, today we're going for more of a wade in upwording waters. As some of you may recall, upwording is founded in the belief that our everyday use of language habitually enforces concepts and systems of coercion and hierarchy, and it advocates making an active, conscious shift towards language that invites more constructive conversation. Varying vocabulary is not the singular objective. It's about examining the intent that informs the words we use. Today I'm joined by a group of upwording practitioners for a session similar to their regular peer practice, and there will be more details about that later. If you've listened to parts one or two of this upwording series, you'll already be familiar with Rivka Rubin and Charles Lauder, who have previously been guests on the show and who are the founders of the practice. But today we're also joined by fellow practitioners Jen Wilson and Marianne Levantal. Jen Wilson is also the founder of International Day of Consent, which is actually next month in November. It's the 30th of November, and I'm going to be doing a special Islington Mill and based around the International Day of Consent with Jen next month. So stay tuned for that. But it's fitting that today, consent seemed to be one of the most central concepts that we ended up talking about on the show. So I'm not going to speak anymore. I'm going to hand over to myself and today's guests for part three in Islington Mill Anne's Upwording series. So we're gathered here today in Studio 409 to do part three of the series on Upwording, and I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves to the listeners. Who are you? Rivka, you've been on this before, but you start. Tell the, refresh the listeners as to who you are. Okay, so my name is Rivka Rubin. I am... I instigated Upwording in 2016 with Charles Lauder, mm-hmm. um, also a co-custodian of Islington Mill. Okay. I'm Jen Wilson, um, I'm an artist, writer, performer, producer, coach, a bunch of whole loads of different things. Mm-hmm. I've been um, part of the Upwording community for about three or four years now I think, coming on to. And I'm also the founder of the International Day of Consent. Oh, that's quite interesting. I think we'll, I'll ask you about that later. Um, my name is Mariana Rentel. I'm from Argentina, but I'm uh, living in Colombia now. Okay. Uh, I'm a professor there at the University of Antioquia, and also I'm, I'm an artist. Cool. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I'm Charles Lauder. As Rivka mentioned, we are the early instigators of upwording um, and have been practicing and honing this for some little time. I'm also, rather like Jen, a bit of a portfolio Mm -hmm. kind of career. I'm a producer, director, film, TV, theatre and uh, I do some management consultancy work facilitating, quite often focused on equality or equity as I prefer, diversity, inclusion and belonging. Okay, great. Thank you for those introductions. Rivka, you mentioned before we started recording that there was a particular reason why you were all gathered here today, not just to do this podcast, but what was that reason? Can you tell us? Yes, Mariana Rental arrived yesterday in Manchester. I think the journey was Colombia to Vienna, via Munich, London and up here. And the reason is because we invited Mariana to be artist in residence on the fifth floor, new residential space. So one of the very early ones. So the the two of us uh, get going into residency for three, four days. The idea is it's a little pre mini residency, including this podcast, meeting people throughout the mill and beyond uh, to then set up a bigger, longer one, uh, hopefully around maybe 2024, 2025. 
Could you tell me what the residency involves? Oh, we don't know yet. Ah, okay, it's still in development. <laughs> but it should, it might involve, yeah, upwording, textiles, language, movement. Okay. A repertoire. Cool. <laughs> it's also special because for the whole time that we've been engaged with upwording, mm -hmm. this is the first time that we've met in real life. Yeah. So that's... Oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazingly special, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me as well. Yeah, the yeah. same. Having um, seen you, Mariana, through a, a video screen, doing upwording, and also the Tender Hotel project that mm. we worked on together over the last few years, it, it's almost strange not to hear the sounds of Columbia in the background and <laughs> <laughs> the fuzzy interference sometimes on the screen. And yeah, it's great to see you. Yeah, and there's there's this slightly weird sense of really knowing someone mm -hmm. and then only being oh <laughs> this is the first time we've actually met there's a kind of um connection that comes with the, the upwording practice i think mm -hmm. maybe more so than than just having conversations on zoom where you we've declared quite detailed things about ourselves to each other in those sessions and so there's a real sense that you already know someone then it's like oh hang on Mm. First time there's a physical form to go with the the, the sort of top half. Mm. Mm. That must be quite a that must be quite a strange sensation actually, because I think like surely that's only something that's possible within the last ten twenty years that you can get to know someone that well without actually meeting them. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And I just want to say I have had the joy of meeting all the people here and mm. some who are not here yet and they'll come because I travel so and I make sure I actually do see them on my <laughs> travels and that's how Mariana got here because we met mm -hmm. on a beach in the Caribbean in La Providencia mm. several times and then the strange thing also is the interesting thing is that Mariana turns out, applied for the PhD post <laughs> at Manchester Metropolitan University, which was the PhD student doing work with Islington Mill oh, wow. on alternative uh, art schools, because we've been running the Islington Mill Art Academy. Mm -hmm. We started that 10, oh, 12, 13 mm -hmm. years ago now, and then we did the intensive one. Uh, Mariana didn't get it. We think that's because she wasn't actually based in Europe. Okay. What an incredible little coincidence mm. to go with a 17 little seater machine by somebody's recommendation in Paris via some other island and then meet her and now she's here. <laughs> and as um, Jenny, you've said, we've worked on a project called Tender Hotel and that started during the pandemic. So yes, we've really worked on the principles of upwording mm. and we've been uh, meeting each other mm. uh, sometimes more or less regularly on the Fridays peer practice that is open to everyone. Mm -hmm. Can I just rewind a little bit and ask, what is Tender Hotel? <laughs> Shall I try? Mm. Tender Hotel um, is a, uh, it is and was a, uh, a virtual hotel that exists in a void, um, which manifested as a 24, no, 25 hour online experience during the pandemic where um, Rivka and Mariana and myself and a handful of other um, interesting artists from around the world um, built this virtual imaginary hotel space uh, on the principle of exploring the feelings of love, care and discomfort. So that was our starting point. We arrived at a hotel um, and um, we invited people to be guests in our hotel and artists to take up rooms and spaces in the hotel to welcome the guests in and it was an extraordinary online holiday experience. <laughs> <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> on Zoom, all taking place on Zoom. Um, um, one of the things that I particularly associate with Mariana in that um, is that um, we sent a box, a little gift box, to people who had signed up to be joining the hotel with us. And um, the gift box uh, of, of complimentary items from Tender Hotel was items that were designed to put together that would make 
that online experience more sensory, more mm-hmm. physical touch, connection of, of things, mm. of, of marks and things and touchable things. And, um, and the box became called Sanchez. Yeah. And um, some of the beautiful uh, things that Mariana put in the box, um, some of them didn't manage to make it into the box yeah. because of complexities of international postage challenges and all sorts of things. But um, I very much felt when I received my box that it, it was a way of making a physical connection with someone who I'd only met online. Mm. Mm. It was like uh, Zoom actually was a portal, like an extension mm. or a prosthesis to access mm. the other one. Mm. And I think the objects really were like this this analog quality to them, no? the textures and so on were really kind of a, a grabbing someone's hand, mm. no? yeah. like the clay marks and so on. And the scent. And the same. I think we, yeah, yeah, so it was tactile, you could read things, there were movement scores, there were things that you required when you visited a guest in the hourly room. Mm-hmm. So there's visitors and there's guests who made an experience, whether it was reading or dancing together or having a party or creating a song, etc. So uh, there was things in the box that you would then use, mm. including some party poppers for someone's birthday. So it really was as much of a holiday, like you say, an experience. And if you were there for a few hours, people said they really felt they had been away. Mm. Mm. And Mariana, you have now brought the things that couldn't be sent yeah. in the post at that time. <laughs> so they've arrived, I've not seen them yet. Yeah, yeah. Finally. <laughs> yeah. Something else that's fascinating about the whole thing was, of course, you could join whenever you wished. And some people would join on Zoom and go out for a walk mm. where, where they were in the world at the first thing in the morning or last thing at night. So this real sense of you engaging with the different times of day mm. in a way that was slightly surreal at times, mm. really. Because mm. um, if you stayed up late, as I often would do, and then you suddenly tune in and it's you're seeing someone going out for their morning stroll. Mm. It's like r- really strangely evocative mm. sensations that kick in. So it wasn't just, it, it stopped being ju- just a Zoom mm. and became a, a kind of toe in, in the water in all these different parts of the world. It's, mm. it's, it's a fascinating experience. We had actually. five sunrises. The first one started with the, with the uh, founders of Circus Oz actually giving us a sunrise in Melbourne, I think it was. And then there was one in Vietnam, one in Johannesburg, and one in Philadelphia. Not Philadelphia, no, it was LA, I think, near there. And then the last one in Mexico on the beach. Wow. And then we had walk in the snow and, yeah. That's it, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think what I've been thinking a lot recently about identity and community and trust and connection and a lot of those are themes that come through when we're talking about upwording and I think that it was one of the things that was extraordinary about Tender Hotel and is extraordinary about upwording because also it has that international dimension to it is that there is a sense of I don't know, perhaps it's just me. I believe I have a sense of shared identity with all of the people involved in that because of shared values, because we were sharing love, care and discomfort and we were coming at that, those ideas from similar ethics and, and the desire in upwording to make the world a more desirable place for all is what keeps us as a community, as a movement, as a, a feeling of common ground for me in our communication. Mm. I think that the, the, um, something Charles said before, like we shared intimate things, but, the, but that's, at the same time they become very kind of uh, mundane mm. in a good sense, in the sense also they, they become uh, graspable and touchable and, and then, yeah, it's so easy when you I mean, the, it's it's funny. The subjective can come out and then become objective, and then uh, one can indeed play with that sense of appropriation or or not. No, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. 
Um, yeah. I think I like to connect it to upwording. Mm -hmm. I mentioned just before that uh, I'd, I'd like to explain it like um, the Tender Hotel came from seven people coming together and choosing to work together, um, applying the upwording principles, mm -hmm. maybe values is a more comfortable word. Um, and some of those, for instance, uh, if those of you have already listened, or if not, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it again, is that nothing happens unless everybody wants it to happen, mm -hmm. unless everybody agrees to it happening. Uh, there may be a consent mm -hmm. to something, uh, and that, that in fast manifested not necessarily in a vote, or a, do we all agree? In fact, I don't remember really ever asking, do we agree? Well, what we noticed is the energy, if something was proposed, like an idea, whether it had traction, whether it had excitement, and therefore it would move into the next meeting. These are the planning creative meetings. Or if something maybe was quite exciting as an idea and then didn't, come up again, it just simply didn't have traction at that moment. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean that there was anyone evaluating something as either a good idea or a bad idea or a worthwhile one or a not worthwhile one. So the, the whole judgment evaluation was literally at bay, it was out the room, I think. That was one of the many elements at play. Mm. So that was one of the elements okay. that were really at play, this, mm. this absence of judgment or anyone being the person uh, that might have made a decision or was the curator or was in charge. So there was no one particular in charge. It was the things that happened are those that we wanted to make happen. There were other elements. Yeah, I, I'm just noticing that word invitation and it feels really significant in upwording in Tender Hotel and in a lot of the work that I do around consent also. Of, of it being an invitation that um, I and the other people involved take up or don't take up, and it doesn't matter if the invitation isn't taken up. It's not a requirement or a demand or a um, something onerous that someone has to take on for everybody else. Like you say, it, it, the invitation was carried forward or it wasn't. And it chimes very much with the, 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 the sort of foundations of upwording, which is to take away those habitual uses of language that are about coercion or hierarchy. So the mention has been made that there's no judgment of good or bad. As soon as you introduce those kinds of um, extremes, that presupposes that someone is in a position to make the judgment as to what constitutes good or bad. And the, the absolute un underlining of, of upwording is to move away from that because it has so much become the habit of how we speak. And so you start becoming aware of the fact that if you move away from that, then more things move towards that. Do we want to? Mm. Would we like to? Would we even love to? Mm. And those are the guidance for what happens next, rather than you must, mm. you need to, mm. we have to, mm. which are precisely the principles that we're trying to move away from in terms of how we use language, which is how we came to be in the space to do upwording. Mm. So if you like, the shift might be that there might be an exclamation of going, oh, I really love that, mm. or even just that, and then it would be built on. And by the absence of going, but by the absence of it's a good idea or bad, if, if the idea of, oh, that's a great idea, isn't in the room, then there's also no absence of somebody saying it's a great idea. Therefore, people are not feeling that their idea was great, bad, and therefore stupid, and there's a lot more trust to put forward anything. Because that anything that I noticed in those weeks um, was so free to put forward an idea, knowing that something it might spark something else and it sparked 
it really sparked lots of things. So there was no defensiveness of going, oh, is my idea not good enough? Or maybe I won't speak next time because nobody picked up on it. Mm. It always has something. I think that the, uh, I'm thinking about a, a particular thing that it's very interesting for both projects, at Wording and, and Tender Hotel. Um, that when people, we, we have the desire to invite someone from outside. It's because it's going to shift and move and kind of make the make another flavor of this um, of this um, yeah of this um, weave that is language. No, it's not just about choosing how to communicate, but rather uh, for me at least uh, to add texture to to it. It's not uh, no. I it's not just to choose, <laughs> uh, but rather shapes of, or shades of choosing, or so, if that makes sense for you guys. Yeah, I find often it infuses, so something, it, it gives, I think you said, it adds texture. Yeah. And we, maybe even not just add, it creates the very texture, yeah. so any other voice person, part of it, creates the very thing that comes out, and I think what was interesting is the, somewhere along the line an idea came up, oh, maybe it's a hotel maybe mm. it's 24 hours, none of those were required to stay. So it, there was nothing, you asked before, what is the residency here? Mm -hmm. And you said, <laughs> we don't know yet. Mm. And that is exactly what we entered with. We are here together because there's seven people who would like to, for a reason, to do something together. There's a little budget. Mm. We have a date. And we, we didn't even have the three words at that time, mm. love, care, and discomfort. So we just didn't know yet what it would be other than there is a date. Saturday, February, whatever it was in 2020, mm. yeah. I think um, there's definitely a leaning into that curiosity um, of the, that, the texture that comes from being curious and inviting in mm. and seeking connection. Um, and I think one of the things that um, upwording doesn't, upwording resists, is the desire to um, separate out and to categorise and other as there's this and there's that mm. and binary kinds of thinking but instead leaning into the discomfort actually is a really useful word the discomfort of curiosity and of not knowing and of not having defined exactly what it is and where the outcome is and who is doing what um, um, but which is incredibly unfamiliar and uncomfortable for what well, it certainly was for me when I first started that it's becoming more comfortable I think um, it's unfamiliar I think that's what it is navigating the world without those clear sort of binary categories and labels and things that feel certain that are not really certain and the, the certainty we try to apply to them is actually what's unhelpful sometimes. You did mention that um, Tender Hotel was about, I believe, love, care and discomfort. Mm -hmm. it, it is the, that's kind of um, set the context for that for me, because I was wondering what, why discomfort was being paired with love and care, because they're, to me, they don't feel that similar. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I think that is interesting that you just like kind of explained that there and why the tenet of discomfort was important in that. Mm. But if you're becoming comfortable with that discomfort, is it still discomfort? I think, I think that once you become comfortable, there's more room for further discomfort, for further curiosity, for further texture, mm. for more weaving. Mm. Um, so you're in and out of comfort, perhaps. Mm. There's also something about that engagement that, that fuels. So curiosity, I think, grows. And the more you feed it, the more it grows. And so that whole sense of it not being binary, so you don't come to a finite. You've not arrived anywhere. You're simply consistently on the journey to another dis development, another discovery, another interest. 
and it's uh, for me it's a little bit like um like a muscle the more you practice it the stronger it gets the more you want to practice it the stronger it gets and and that's part of the joy dare i use the word of upwording is that moving away from the binary allows an investigation of nuance it allows us to engage without necessarily the desire to agree on everything. Mm. It is perfectly possible still to have an engaging and exciting exchange and not come away from it, oh, we're all on the same side. Mm. Mm. And I think, especially within the context of where a lot of what's going on in the wider world of that, you're over here or you're over there. And you can't have a foot in both camps. Oh, that's not allowed. Allowed. There's this real sense of predetermined parameters, predetermined positions and labels. I am a this. Says who? Mm. And how did that arrive at? Or perhaps more challenging, you are a that. Mm. Mm. And the more we, we, we have those conversations about, if there were not a label, how might that be liberating? For me, one of the things I find liberating with that is to, be, to engage uh, more with the not like-minded. Mm -hmm. Because if I go to, if I follow the, I agree with you, and therefore I feel excited because you agree with me, and we are all in that group of agreement with the like-minded, which has been quite foregrounded, being, wanting to be with like-minded people, is it then possibly that we are staying within the same of what we already know, whilst at the same time there does seem to be at least a spoken desire in, uh, to start engaging with people who don't think the same as I do at this moment. So how can I do that when I keep seeking company of the like-minded? Mm. So going into the actual upwording, and you, Jenny, Jen was talking a lot about the, the binaries, even to calm down the, I agree with you, I don't agree with you, it might be the implied if I don't say I agree with you, and instead, either just being, adding to, or asking for more, or adding something to, means it becomes easier, I've noticed, to move away from the either or. Do you stand over here or do you stand over there? And the radio is still saying, so do you agree with this or do you agree with that? It keeps giving us these like two um, op opposed options. So how do we practice multifarious thinking and finding connections somewhere with each, potentially each person if we choose to do so, and, and connecting. That does not mean that I am, that I align to somebody's practices. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, um, I wonder how the rest of you guys think, feel about the word consensus, mm. because um, it's so so close to the word consent, and in, in some languages, I think is almost the, the same, same. The yeah. same word in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think also in Italian is the same word. And I think that sometimes when one talks about consensus, it can feel like lowest common denominator. <laughs> kind of dumbing down of ideas, things like that get associated with consensus, I think. Ideas like that get associated with the concept of consensus, that we've all got to agree to disagree, and, you know, it gets a bit wishy-washy. And actually, I wonder if consensus is more about the slightly uncomfortable place where, where we are ready to move forward together as a group of people even if we don't wholeheartedly see it exactly the same way, there is sufficient consensus to proceed. I'm throwing that in there. Mm. I, don't have, I don't know if that's the answer. The answer. An answer. Can I, can I offer a little, can I, can I pull a little, what you call it, like a little hold moment and offer noticing? Mm. We said before 
we might notice some notice things. We tend to notice where something manifests in language, either in the word, mm -hmm. like the shoulds or the have tos or the must or the other, mm -hmm. or or when it may be more subtle. Could I, may I, just Please for the purpose of this, offer yeah. one? Okay, so when I just heard you say the wishy-washy. Mm. Judgment, yeah. And it's so subtle. Mm. Because at that moment I go, yeah, 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 I think wishy-washy too, so I'm not cut joining, not noticing that has just that there's just been a judge. And th so the practice that we're engaging in is just to notice, it's not to go, that was a bad thing, or turn mm. ourselves off, that would be mm. contrary to the practice itself. <coughs> just to notice and to see at what points might that be not there. Maybe it is okay to be there. It's not about policing the language. It's about noticing what the intention is doing. Yeah. Um, is anybody possibly f feeling judged by that comment? Or is it maybe, in this case, just a little one which is giving a little flavour of? Mm -hmm. It probably could be... Sorry. Yeah, and I think, uh, thank you for noticing that. I think that my um, hint of judgement there comes from a perception that there is a... Uh, a a co a group of people, <laughs> this fictional them, you know, like the yeah. us and them. I mean, us and them, thinking that there is a them somewhere that um, wants to diss the idea of consensus being useful because that them wants uh, a different way of arriving at structure and system and governance and power. Um, so moving away from the us and them in that, I think what I was aiming for in our conversation is to have a more explicit shared understanding in this conversation about what consensus could mean and how that could play out. Mm. Just because my mind works like that sometimes consensus consent us oh. <laughs> yeah and, and, and it's just that moment of saying where did it come from and why why the words similar mm. and then listening rather than necessarily seeing the writing so i was hearing consensus consent us consensus consent us and and maybe that that was the original intention because because when you said we can agree <clears throat> Excuse me. We can agree to move forward, even if we're not all in agreement. Of, I thought it was a really interesting way of looking at that. Mm -hmm. So the consent is, even though I am not in total agreement, I am still prepared to travel with. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting distinction. Mm -hmm. That consent isn't always. Yeah, it's great. I'm with you on that. The mm. consent can be, mm. I'm not moved enough not to be with you mm. because of that. Mm. It's willingness rather than wanting to. Yeah. Yeah. From my point of view, I feel like we are living in an age where consent is seen as a very binary thing. It's like there is only two possible answers to a question of consent, yes or no. Whereas consensus is something that is made up of a various various kinds of different answers and then you take the median answer which is the one that seems to be like in, in a democratic system the consensus is that this party got the most votes so they go in but there's maybe four or five different parties whereas consent maybe it's maybe this is something you could explain to me if I'm not necessarily getting it wrong but how I see consent operating specifically now and specifically within marginalized communities it's a very binary thing mm. where it's like yes or no. Mm. And I do think that that is problematic in a way because in a lot of the scenarios where you hear consent being brought up, there's not, maybe not always a binary answer. I think quite often the conversation about consent doesn't necessarily examine what is being played out. Quite often it's a power imbalance mm. and the consent requirement is I want this mm. 
and that this I want is your consent, mm. as opposed to that it's a mutually arrived mm. at. And I think that's where the binary comes in, mm. because, and again, it, it, it relates to what we talk about with upwording. It's not only coercion, it's also about power with as opposed to power over. And I think a lot of the consent discussions are about the individual with power over determining the desire to have the individual who is less powerful consent. Mm. And that's where the binary comes in because it's about, it starts being translated as giving in. Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, fundamentally for me, I see consent not as that transaction, not as a thing you can acquire. Mm. You don't acquire someone's consent. You um, practice. Consent. It's a practice. Consent is an ongoing, in the moment practice. Um, that um, you know, it, 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 as the circumstances shift. I remember. I mean, even in the in the in the quite um, boundaried and very importantly, at times lines drawn territory of sexual consent. Mm -hmm. I remember talking with someone who is a consent sex educator mm. with teens who had a room full of teenage boys saying, there's a point at which I can't stop. If we've got to hear, I couldn't stop. And the educator said, if your grandma walked in the room, could you stop? Oh yeah, I could stop if grandma walked in the room. Mm. So there are circumstances under which that cha change there is change, the consent is gone. And they could see that one mm. as a very obvious one, but actually, you know, the wind changing, somebody feeling unwell, somebody feeling tired now, somebody feeling sleepy or too drunk or whatever is going on, change happens constantly. So, mm. so consent in any context is an ongoing practice and navigation, not yeah. this thing, as you say, Charles, of um, a thing you've got to acquire in yeah. order to get on with what you really want to like do. Like a something. contract, and yeah. then it's signed, and then you have it. Yeah. It's more something that needs to be constantly questioned. Yeah. Hmm. I also feel like in the modern, when we're hearing about consent and stuff in the modern conversations, and like the sexual consent stuff, I think is probably the biggest area of consent that we're getting, that we're hearing about in the media and just online and through people we know and stuff. It does strike me as well that like, not giving consent is, how do I explain this? Positive consent doesn't necessarily have to be vocalised. It can just be inferred. Whereas negative consent is vocalised. Oh, that's the old yes means yes, no means no kind yeah. of stuff. You know, yeah. that if you don't, that um, a consent is assumed unless someone actually says, I yes. don't want to. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's changing? You just said there, you, it's an old, but how do, how do you think we I stand have, on that these days? I hope that that's changing. And mm. certainly the young people that I talk to, some of them have um, a greater awareness than um, certainly I did. I'm 52 um, when I was growing up um, of, um, other kinds of ways that people communicate and so things like fight, flight, freeze, fawn, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. um, and realising that it's not okay that if someone is just frozen or silent or, you know, that affirmative consent, yeah. actually spoken yes, yeah. is required. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think that people, I think more people understand that principle perhaps than used to. Mm -hmm. um, however, I th still think when we look at consent beyond just sexual consent, but also in the context of the permissions or agreements you make in any interaction mm -hmm. in your own brain, the mm -hmm. permission you give yourself mm -hmm. to say yes or no to something. Yes. The times you say, I couldn't possibly do something like that. Someone like me couldn't possibly, or should or must or have to back to upwording. <laughs> yeah. um, as well as the interpersonal or the group or the systemic um, level of consent of, of, of we live in coercive and hierarchical systems where mm -hmm. people do have power over others. Yeah. Um, 
so when you look at consent from with that much broader perspective i think that that um that distinction or that simple yes means yes no means no just doesn't make sense anymore mm. for me mm. there are things that are, that are yes absolutely I totally want to do that mm. and things that are no I definitely I'm not okay with doing that mm. I think I spend most of my time in the kind of middle zone where I'm not sure if I want to do that or not yeah and I need to get curious <laughs> I want to get <laughs> curious <laughs> need <laughs> That's another one of those self noticing <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Would you I'm say. I'm wondering could... about something. Sorry. Uh, um, yeah. Because I come from another context. Mm. Um, it keeps linger this question about limits, about how come the. the, the um, the practice of uh, of setting them and dismantling them mm. come about. How can one actually be on that practice without naming it as consent? Mm. Actually, that's a, like a kindergarten for <laughs> you know for for consent because um, I find this very problematic in the in the context I live in. Mm-hmm. Um, Say a bit more. Mm. Um, I think that I I I live in a very um, uh, pleasing environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to set up boundaries, it's really hard work mm-hmm. um, because you you have to deal with all these cultural things. Uh, that have a lot of generations behind behind them. Mm. So, I was yeah, just a question: How can one practice this uh, t- this setting up of boundaries and then this ma- be also comfortable with dismantling them at the same time? You know, because it's a yeah. kind of a movement of uh, yeah of practicing that consent. And I guess it is about that that fluidity and discomfort Mm -hmm. of the territory that is uncertain and not binary Mm -hmm. and looking to push into that territory Mm -hmm. um not you know stuff i think i think boundaries get talked about a lot and sometimes the word boundary is used to mean things that aren't boundaries really. I think for me a boundary is, is really a limit, is really the, the, mm-hmm. the line you cannot cross without causing harm or danger or something very bad happens when the line is crossed. Maybe that is where, what is a boundary? I don't know. What, I'm interested in what you mean by boundaries and limits. Um, because I, when I say boundaries, I mean the shades of it, mm. not really uh, determination towards yeah, not the limit, either, not the either line. this or mm. that, the binary concept, but rather the shades of grey between that. Mm. Well, where you can uh, mindfully go to to the left, but you don't agree with everything. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, mm. I'm interested in shapes and shades and mm. textures of. of of these kind of things. Yeah. Uh, that's why also I, I talk about dismantling them yeah. at the same time, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's not just the no, it's the no because. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, I haven't got time to go through the whole <laughs> detail, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, but the, cons- the consent compass model, which I'm developing, which I'm going to release this year's International Day of Consent, mm-hmm. talks about for consent to be in place. You need, you need to. Uh, it's helpful to understand where the four points on the compass are in relation to you using your agency to make a choice mm-hmm. and holding yourself accountable for the choices that you make. Mm-hmm. And that those points on the compass to navigate are responsive to change, 
is one. Responding to what's going on in this moment is constantly shifting. Um, in, informed, curious, questioning, that part. S specific, contextual, what, who, who are we navigating this with and when and how and what does it mean today? And explicit, so how it is communicated and what is discussed around it. And if all of those four elements are understood, then a meaningful consent can be given. Mm. Does that help though, Mariana, in terms of the, <laughs> the grey areas? I think. <coughs> But it's not to avoid the grey mm. areas. I think what's important as well for yeah. me in coming up with the compass model is that that is very much about one's own individual capacity to consent, mm -hmm. the decision you're making for yourself. And I, I frame my work in the context of looking for consensus, looking for connection, mm -hmm. looking for common ground and common good. Mm -hmm. um, because you could... <laughs> use your individual decision making to go I don't care about anyone else that's that's an option yeah. um, but that's not an option I'm recommending and I don't think that is consent because it doesn't work towards consensus and common ground and so on I'm liking all of those things um, uh, the um, it's maybe slightly different words uh, consent can be revoked it can be mm -hmm. At this moment, I would like to. At another moment, I definitely do not want to. There might be things, like you said, Jen, that are up, that really are things that you definitely do not want. Oh. I'd probably go, most probably not, for mm. the remaining life, but that might change. Mm. We don't know. It could change. Or the, depending on the context. Uh, so, and I love the grace. <laughs> because of all of that, because it can change mm. depending on who, what, or how I'm feeling at that mm. moment. Can I just interject here, just because I want to? You talked about the kind of shades of grey that are involved in consent, and you might not know yet. Is that the discomfort that you're trying to explore, or was that the discomfort of Tender Hotel, where you're leaning into love, care, and discomfort? The grey area, the yeah. bit between the definite yes and the yeah. definite no. Were you just being able to admit to yourself that I don't know? Mm, perhaps. I think probably. Now we're hearing it. Uh, I, I think in the, the interesting thing about the operating practice, three letter word, yet. Mm. I don't know yet. Mm. I mm. haven't got enough information yet mm. yeah so th the sense is that I don't want to at this point mm. should X Y Z A B C and maybe a whole bunch of other letters that I'm not even thinking about at the moment mm. change mm. then my response may also change and it's mm. a may also change because mm. it may be that that additional information reinforces the position I'm currently holding. Mm -hmm. Being open to the idea that something else might come in is part of what the curiosity is. So if I'm uncomfortable here because I don't know yet, I might, being curious to become more comfortable, go and find out some more. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting thing for me about how we, how we start to frame our decision making that isn't just about the language, it's also about what's in my mind when I'm using the language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those three little letters together start to mediate. Mm. Mm. Yet. Mm. <laughs> Today, right now, in this moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There was something else I wanted to ask you about as well, which you brought up there. Um, and this ties into something I've been thinking myself recently in terms of consent. And it's when you enter into a space where there is a particular system in place and people have authority within that system and enact authority upon you, but perhaps you haven't consented to them enacting that authority upon you. But we've been talking a lot here, so I'm kind of can't exactly remember exactly what you said, 
a couple of minutes ago, but you said that there was something, but that's not consent because... Yeah, so I was saying that um, you could go through the motions mm. of the process and practice of consent um, and make your own mind up that you're willing to proceed and say yes to something without care to the the common good, the mm. harm it might do to others. Yeah. So put it in a nutshell, do whatever you want, but don't hurt anyone while you're doing it. It's yeah. kind of an oversimplification perhaps of what, what I'm trying to get out there. Yeah. But it is that our, our agency, our capacity to consent, our free will is, I hope, boundaried by our ability to account for our own actions in the context of trying to connect and build consensus with others. Mm. So you may not have very much agency and you probably at the same time have very little accountability in the situation you just described where you've come into an environment where authority is being enacted upon you. Mm -hmm. You have some degree of agency, whether to stay in that space perhaps or go, or mm. um, whether to resist that, that, that authority or not, whether to ask a question or not, that you can use your agency to that extent. And the impact of using that agency, you will be accounting for in some way. Mm. Uh, but the, the, the greater accountability in that situation rests with the people who are enacting authority upon you because they have they have taken that yeah leadership role that authoritative role and and they are using a lot more agency than you are in that situation and therefore they have a lot more to account for yeah hmm. like for instance i didn't consent to suella braverman being the home secretary Mm -hmm. And I don't know many people who, not that there has been a vote for her to step into that position of power. There was never a vote for that, except within the Tory party themselves. So that was never something that was handed over to the public to make a consensus of. It's just a situation that we've arrived at. And I didn't consent to her being granted and being able to enact certain powers over me as somebody who isn't a British citizen. I didn't consent to that. But it's still a reality that we live under because she has been granted that power and she can impose that authority upon me. That's a very big picture kind of framing of what I'm trying to explain here. But then on a much smaller micro level, it can happen in interpersonal relationships or just like going on a forum or something, on, an, on just on a Reddit or a forum or something and, and people start arguing and somebody adopts a position of authority on a certain subject. Why, I don't know exactly where I'm going with this, but I just this is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. It's just like, people who enact authority upon me, do I need to have consented to be the person who is enacted upon? Because in a lot of cases I haven't. But mm -hmm. yet still, they can carry ahead with that as if I have. Mm. I mean, yeah, you what you're describing is coercive systems mm -hmm. um, and we have some agency to address the coercive systems that we are in mm. um, or to not do mm. which is to just bimble along not worrying about it and never mind mm. um, and um, fundamentally safety becomes one of the most important issues yeah because because if somebody is about to attack you then empathy and curiosity is probably not going to help you in that moment running away might be a better strategy mm. Mm. i'm not sure mm. i'm curious about that i don't know i'm getting a reaction mm. here so it's well, safety i'm getting a response <laughs> okay. I'm getting out. Hey, oh, noticing. Oh, I, don't, well, I don't know whether it was in the whole. I don't know if it was all. I'll read you that one. I feel yeah. that in, that safety is an important prerequisite for the ability to be curious and empathetic to someone who is presenting threat towards yeah. you. Yeah. 
Can I use a different example? If yes. the building's on fire, I'm probably not going to be particularly curious and I'm not going to invite some eliciting what you think about leaving soon <laughs> <in> which way. <laughs> mm. um, the, the reason I had a response to that and I went quite <laughs> evaluative, I shook my hand, went, mm -hmm. you know, can't <laughs> see it on the radio, but, yeah. Yeah. is I just remembered in nonviolent communication uh, and in other uh, of, of, of forms of how do you... What can you do when you have very little agency because you are actually in an attack? Mm. And it does seem from the various things I've been reading is that to form a connection with, to form some, and that's where empathy maybe comes in, some interest in, some curiosity, come, some understanding towards the other person by by accepting that there is a reason for why at this moment, I'm going to use a particular example, are robbing you. Mm -hmm. So something about connecting with that person's need to rob you at that moment, because they probably need it more than I do or more than somebody else, means that people have, I wouldn't, don't know if I would have the, how do you say, the, the presence of mind, mm -hmm. but to make a connection about mm. and understanding the need, which is, it might be a need for, well, it might, it might be wanting to buy food, mm. it might be wanting to pay bills, it might be wanting, uh, has actually meant that either the then taking of or the robbing of didn't turn into more violence, or it didn't happen, or there was apology, or there's loads of stories mm. around that. So I think there is something in there because the empathy connects and the curiosity connects. The judgment of it is wrong to do that does not. Mm. Mm. They already oh, know, yeah. and they'll, mm. they, they'll, yeah. And taking Niall's example of Suella Braverman, then <laughs> someone who is about to vote Conservative, shouting "You're wrong! Don't do that!" Yeah, is not going to change their mind. Mm. Getting curious as to what it is about what Suella Braverman said that appeals to them mm. might. Yeah. Yeah. One kind of instance of what I've been describing there, though, that I've been thinking of is, and this is something like what we were just discussing with Suella Braveman. Obviously, she is the Home Secretary, so the system she is working within is a very long, it's the democratic system, for want of a better term, parliamentary democracy. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years, so that's not something that is that easy to question or to kind of you know, it's a question basically. But for instance, so say you're online and you discover a forum for a particular kind of minority group that you yourself are a part of, and then you start accessing the forum and talking to people there. But then there are already people within that forum who start kind of using their authority within that space to stop you from talking or to change what you're talking about or to tell you that you're wrong or something like that. That's much more a kind of Cons there's a to me the feeling of consensus within that space is much stronger than it is walking down the street out there knowing that Suella Braverman is my home secretary I didn't consent to that it's not a consensus decision that was made it's just a fact that happened and we had very little say in it whereas when you enter into a, um, an area where which is much seems to be much more built upon consensus but then people are still enacting authority within those spaces without your consent to be the, the subject of that authority mm. is... Thanks, yeah. I, I've noticed that if I don't like that authority, um, and I definitely do tend to react quite strongly against, and I would say now react against authority, I'm not going to get anywhere I've noticed if I become authoritarian. Mm -hmm. in response or I attack or I go what you are doing now is wrong you've just taken authority or try and explain what people do what I have noticed seems to move someone and open that up is again curiosity is to ask so let's say somebody's making a judgment mm -hmm. I can say what is it about that has just been proposed or we're talking about that you don't like at the moment mm -hmm. so I can turn the judgment, the generalised subject, it is wrong or bad or we shouldn't mm. go here or there, into what is it specifically you don't 
a like or appreciate about that. So it becomes personal, so I can open up. Um, I think all of those, yeah. Could you say more? Would you be willing to say more about what it is that irks you with it? Or what would you like instead? Mm. What is important to you? I can find out. And that means I've not entered into the authority. Because mm. it will take, in that case, there is a, I have some agency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, maybe using agency to ignore the authority and mm -hmm. continue in the way that you feel is modelling the way you would like the group to communicate yeah. and operate yeah. um, is another another strategy for mm -hmm. that. Um, agency, massive term, and mm -hmm. we've just started using it, mm -hmm. coming up, almost coming up to an hour into it. And yes, the, the situations I've been describing were like, I have absolutely no agency in Swella Braverman being the Home Secretary. Yeah. None. But I do have agency in terms of entering into a space where I feel like I'm contributing to a space of shared values. So I think agency, yeah, uh, agency is a massive thing to talk about. Um, Maybe we could, how about we make that a topic for one of the Yeah, sure, I would, definitely. I would really like to. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a, a really big part of the work I do around yeah. consent and yeah, I'd love to pick that conversation up. We are almost at an hour, so maybe closing thoughts, if that's okay. And if you want to say anything about agency, but bearing in mind that like moving forward, agency would be a brilliant thing to talk about yeah. as well, and a more on a longer format. But yeah, coming up to it, it's just gone one hour. Um, any closing thoughts, anything anybody would like to add? Using the noticings, may I? We had a lot of buts. <laughs> we, had, we had an unusually large number of butts. Um, and I think there are a couple of instances, certainly speaking for myself, where whilst I was using the language, I was conscious of the fact that I'd already taken a position. And so, and this comes to what we talk about with upwording about intent. Mm -hmm. So that even though I wasn't using the shoulds, musts, needs. There were instances where the position I'd taken was from a should mm -hmm. perspective. Mm. Yes, it's like the judgment that um, Rivka picked up on in, in the words I was using. They weren't obvious judgment words, perhaps, but the judgment was implicit in some of the things I was saying. Mm. And I think, um, yeah, that noticing and reflection, I think, I think one of the things that I, when I was new to upwording, was I would fall into self-judgment because I wasn't upwording properly. And, <laughs> mm. oh no, I'm not upwording properly, which is the antithesis of upwording. <laughs> and, uh, and now recognising the importance of the noticing and noticing the intention is what's useful is noticing the, my judgment, is noticing my implicit um, yeah. falling into that coercive sort of language and way of thinking. Yeah. yeah. That, I have <laughs> only the same to add. <laughs> the noticings of the more internal ones where, yes, I have certain preferences about how we might want to communicate with one another and they are judgmental in there because I think they're healthier than the ones where we shout at each other mm. or attack each other mm. or frame or label each other or mm. or judge or you know evaluate. So there is a judgment in there. Um, I hope it's a gentle one and not one that is imposed and mm. more mm. on the safety, health, and connection as its yardstick, mm. if you like. Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for the space and I'm all for the grace no. and the textures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the grains. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, thank you guys very much. It was great. Uh, I'll end it there and we shall resume this at a certain point in the future. Thank you. And so, episode three in the Islington Middle and Upwording series comes to a finish but I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing more episodes on reporting in the future. However, if you'd like to find out more about the practice, there is a website, 
upwording.com. However, it's currently under construction. So probably best to give the address for the upwording link tree, which is, bear with me a second. Link tree forward slash upwording. And the spelling on that is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash upwording U-P-W-O-R-D-I-N-G. That's link tree forward slash upwording. And just to remind the listeners that Jen Wilson, who you listened to there on the show, will be back next month on Islington Mill and podcast to discuss their very exciting project, International Day of Consent. So I'll be back next month with Jen and we'll be talking all about that. So until then, I shall bid you adieu. Goodbye for now. <laughs>